It's Bank Earnings Palooza, and we've got a special guest from 3,000 miles away. You're in the right place, folks, because this is where the money is. Welcome to the show, folks. I am David Hansen, normally joined by Matt Kopenheffer, but he is still enjoying his African vacation. So I am joined virtually by Fool contributor John Maxfield, all the way from Oregon, 3,000 miles away. We are very glad to have him here today. And just a, a full disclosure for uh, those of you listening on the podcast, John is remote. This is the first time that we've had a remote guest on the podcast today and on the show. So if the audio quality is not superb, we're sorry, we're working through it, but hopefully it's all right. John's, John's wisdom is worth it if the quality isn't quite that good. Uh, so we'll go to our first headline today from the Wall Street Journal. What else? Bank of America's earnings surge on improved credit. Bank of America reported earnings this morning. John, what did you make of it? Well, you know, I mean, I think that headline says it all, David. You know, Bank of America, if, if you look at their pop, at their bottom line figures, is a fantastic quarter, right? And consider all the headwinds in the industry that we've seen with Wells Fargo, Citigroup, and J.P. Morgan. They have $2.5 billion in profit. And if you take that over a full year, it gives you about a buck a share in earnings, which when you consider where it was last year, when it only earned $340 million, that's not a bad quarter by any stretch of the imagination. However, the one thing to note is that most of that, or a, a, the lion's share of that came from reduction in the provision extent, as opposed to, say, revenue growth, which actually increased. Yeah, absolutely. My, my takeaway of it was it was a pretty boring quarter, which is almost what you, you want to see for Bank of America. We're not in 2011 anymore, where there were these maybe exciting in a bad way where you weren't sure what was really going to come out of the quarter. Uh, but we're really getting to the point where Bank of America, they're getting past a lot of these legal expenses. They're getting past a lot of the loan losses. So it's becoming a little bit boring now, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Moving on to yeah, our, I mean, to, oh, yeah, anything else? To, yeah, to your point, David, I mean, when you consider the headwinds in the industry, a boring quarter is absolutely nothing to complain about right now. Absolutely. All right, moving on to the second bank that was reporting earnings today. We have this one from Bloomberg. U.S. Bank Corp. Re profit a uh, little unchanged on lower bad loan provision. So I guess good news at U.S. Bank Corp. Is that the story? Yeah, so it's the same thing. So one of the headlines I came across was that U.S. Bank Corp. earnings were nearly flat. That, that seems like really nothing to write home about, right? Mm -hmm. But when you consider, again, that mortgage revenues were down considerably all across the industry, and when you consider what's going on with interest rates and what's going on with trading profits, to be able to keep your net income flat was a pretty good accomplishment. When, when you look at U.S. Bank Corp., the stock, one of the things that usually jumps out is, at people is it looks expensive relative to some of these banks like Citigroup, Bank of America. But the performance has always justified that valuation. Is the performance still justifying that valuation? Yeah, so the two things that U.S. Bank Corp. does really well, there's two figures you really had to boil it down to. It'd be the return on equity, which is something like 15% or 14%. I mean, it, it, these are just ridiculous numbers. These are pre-financial crisis numbers. And U.S. Bank Corp. is one of the few in the industry that's able to, to provide these to their shareholders. And when you have a higher return on equity, that justifies a higher multiple on your stock. And then the other thing that U.S. Bank Corp. does really well, and this contributes to its higher return on equity, is that its expenses, its expense base is extremely small. And you can see that with its efficiency ratio, which is something like 52%. And when you compare that to Bank of America, which is 75%, you can really see the strength of a bank like this. Absolutely. All right, moving on to our final couple headlines of the day. We got a, a two for here. The first one is about Key Corp, Key Corp profit up 8.5% as loan book growth grows 5%. And the other one is about PNC, also reporting earnings this morning. PNC profit increases almost 10% on expense cuts and lower provision. So my, take, my quick takeaways on these, these banks, both regional banks, PNC is a little bit bigger, especially with that RBC acquisition moving into the Southeast. We look at the valuation, both are valued pretty similarly, a, a little bit over uh, tangible book, price to tangible book. When I look at both of them from this quarter, not much stands out. Again, a pretty boring quarter. At PNC, a little bit more noise. They've been selling shares of Visa. They held common shares of Visa, so they've been unloading that. There were provisions against mortgage losses a couple years ago, so there's a little bit more noise in PNC, but 
under the hood, I think the operations are pretty strong over at PNC. Uh, the expansion into the southeast is going well. Uh, you look over at KeyCorp uh, that we saw in the headline there, that loan growth was much higher in, in this quarter. And that's something that, that they've been talking about. But an interesting note that they had in the call today was they don't strive to grow, to grow loans. They strive to grow their client base, to grow fees. So one thing we want to be cognizant of when looking at banks, and I think you agree with this, John, is you don't want to just grow loans to grow loans. You want to make good loans that people are going to pay back. You want to be in business with good customers. So I think it's important to look at these loan numbers and say, yes, KeyCorp's loans were up, but that doesn't mean that the business is doing great and that those are very good loans. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I tend to agree with you more. I mean, let's, let's be honest. I mean, to see loan growth, holding all else equal is a very positive thing, mm -hmm. right? But if, it's, if you're growing loans at the expense of credit, it's easy to grow loans at the bank, right? I mean, you can, anybody will take, I mean, but virtually anybody will take a loan if they give them the money. But the, the trick is to write good loans. And, and that's something that we won't know for, a, for an extended time period here. But assuming that those are good loans, I mean, I, I would consider that loan growth to be a very solid result. Absolutely. All right, moving on to our next segment, taking a little bit of a deeper dive at Bank of America. We talked about it in the headlines, but Bank of America, it's, it's such a beast. We got to talk about it some more. And John, you, this is one of the banks that, that you focus on a lot, and you have a background in, in the legal industry. You've done work looking at, at the legal cases of Bank of America. Did, did anything from the legal front stand out in this quarter, or, or what were some of the other main takeaways that, that you had from the, from the report? So on the legal front, the, the thing that really stuck out is the fact that there wasn't really a lot of noise there. So if you look back in the same quarter last year, they, they had a $1.6 billion charge-off for a securities class action that had been filed by Bank of America shareholders related to the Merrill Lynch transaction. Mm -hmm. This year, they didn't really have that. And that's one of the reasons we saw such strong earnings on a year-to-year -year basis. Now, the one thing that I would say is that if you look at their earnings, particularly their earnings before taxes, if you compare that to the second quarter, we see a pretty considerable decline. But we know where this is coming from. And we've seen this with Wells Fargo. We've seen this with Citigroup. We've seen this with J.P. Morgan. This is coming all from that non-interest income part of their income statement. It's coming from a steep decline in mortgage income. And that's, that's a result of significantly higher mortgage rates which is depressing the refinance volumes. Mm -hmm. That's also a function of significantly lower trading volumes. So it, when the Federal Reserve came out in September and said, like, look, you know, we're not going to paper our monthly purchases of bonds, that caused bondholders, institutional investors that are holding bonds, to kind of sit tight on their holdings as opposed to trade them as they would if the Federal Reserve were to make some movements in there. And that reduction in the trading volume Hits banks like Bank of America in their um, in their proprietary trade um, divisions, and the same thing you can say. What I mean is is a very similar thing with um, uh, the debt ceiling because you have the debt ceiling comes out. Now this kind of scares everybody, so everybody's sitting on their portfolios. It gives them yet another reason not to do anything. So those are the two areas where we really saw a large reduction in revenue for Bank of America. Yeah, th those things stood out to me as well as. Those stood out more as kind of quarterly cycles. And I think when you talk about trading, that's a very cyclical business, usually lower in the summertime. And I think it was especially lower because of those reasons you talked about. But looking at some of the, the longer term trends at Bank of America, obviously one of the things that Bank of America and Brian Moynihan have been focusing on is Project New BAC to take expenses out of the system. And one of the numbers that stood out to me was people working there and, and employees. Since September of 2011, Employee headcount is down 15%, which doesn't sound huge, but when you look at the raw numbers, it went from around 290,000 to under 250,000. So over 40,000 employees are, are taken out of that system. So obviously, we don't want that, to, that's not great for the people that are, are no longer working there that have either left or, or been fired um, or laid off. But as a shareholder, I think you, you have to be encouraged that those expenses have been taken out of the system. So you have those expenses taken out of the system and revenues are maybe not surging, but when you can make a, a, a decent level of revenues and take out the expenses, that's where it really falls to the bottom line. 
Yeah, I mean, the name of the game at Bank of America, it is all expensive, mm -hmm. right? If you have an efficiency ratio of 75%, that means that 75% of your revenue is going elsewhere and not to shareholders. And that's a serious problem if you're looking for a, a, a good return as a shareholder. So you have to decrease your headcount. You have to decrease your branch count. And another number that stuck out to me was that their mobile banking customers improved something like 26% on a year-to-year -year basis. Right. And so if you go through all kind of their expense initiatives, you have Project BAC is one of them. And part of that is that they are trying to change up how they are delivering their products to the customers. Because if you can get somebody to do their deposits, to transfer money to other people on their phones, as opposed to walking into a brand, talking, talking to a teller, taking up that time, you can dramatically reduce your expenses. And you can also reduce the number of tellers that you have. So it's, that's another explanation for why you can bring that headcount down so far. Yeah, and with, with trends like that, you really have to look out past just the quarters, too, because it's going to take a while to get those expenses out of the system. You can't just, it's not easy just to close branches and to, to reduce your amount of tellers out there and shift people to mobile. So I think as a long-term investor, that's something you can definitely be encouraged about. It's not something that's going to be a huge benefit for the rest of 2013, but when you look out to 2015, 2016, and then they can keep these expenses out and potentially increase revenue and build the client base, it could be a very powerful franchise. Yeah, I mean, these are these are really positive trends for a bank that was really deep in the trenches just a few years ago. And it, you know, you can you can go through a lot of their other numbers, and there's a lot of other very positive signs, right? Their credit quality improved significantly. Their net charge off ratio is down to 75 basis points. I mean, if somebody were to tell me last year that Bank of America would get the net charge off ratio down to 75 basis points, I mean, I, you know, I would have known what they were thinking. Um, but that's a fantastic number. You know, you get it down 25 more basis points, and you're at a, you're at a normalized level when times are good. Also, their capital, their, their capital uh, levels are, ex are exceptional, second only to Citigroup in this area. So if you look at their Basel III Tier 1 common capital rate, it's up to 9.94%. And again, these are not things that you're going to see in the bottom line in any one quarter over the say, you know, time, time period. But over the long run, these are the types of things that build a fundamentally strong financial institution. So, so I guess final, final take here on the quarter. You're a shareholder. I'm not a shareholder, but I'll ask you, you are a shareholder. Does this quarter make you feel better about your investment at Bank of America still bullish on the long-term prospects here? Yeah, you know, I would say that it, it was what I, what I expected. Again, it made money, which is a very positive thing <laughs> in helps. a very challenging environment, right? Um, there were struggles. There are struggles in the industry. We're going to see banks struggle in the fourth quarter and probably in the first half of next year. Um, but yeah, I mean, all things considered, I, I, would, I would consider it a good quarter from the bank. All right, moving on to our next segment. Let's lighten it up a little bit. That was, that was a little too much Bank of America talk there. We're going to play the game Fool in the Blank. This is where we throw out a scenario that, of course, there is a blank in, and we both fool it in. So our first scenario of the day for Fool in the Blank is blank is the big bank I'm least excited about. So you just sounded pretty excited about Bank of America there, John. Give me the big bank that you are least excited about right now? So the bank that I'm least excited about right now, and this is not something that changed because of this quarter, but it's certainly the, the quarter of the results didn't help it. It's Citigroup. The Citigroup has long been known as the basket case of Wall Street, and there's a reason for that. It's, it's really hard to pin down exactly what they do and exactly how they make money. And then last quarter, we saw that they were at, their revenue was absolutely decimated, and it was this is principally because of trading losses. You know, the, uh, fundamentally, the problem with Citigroup is that it's virtually impossible to determine the risk of that company. And it's because of their global diversification. While they pitch that as a strength, I, as an investor, see that as a, as a significant weakness. John, I think you stole my notes because I had almost the exact same thing. I was going to go with Citigroup as well. You talk about the diversification, and some people look at that and say, wow, that's great. They're in Latin America. They're in Africa. They're in all these emerging economies. China, they just got that deal to go into that, that free trade zone over there in China. And a lot of these things can seem like really good things. But I think when you stretch the strategy like that, like you said, it, it opens the company up to a lot more risks. I mean, you look at a bank like Wells Fargo, they don't have the risk of 
the Mexican property market. Citigroup does have that risk. Now, it's not potentially a risk that's going to drag the bank down and really uh, drag it into bankruptcy by any means if something happens there. But it's something that can be a drag on performance. And I think when you look across the big banks, the strategy at the other three, if we're just talking about the big four, I think I like it a lot better at the other three than I do at Citigroup. All right, moving on to the next scenario. Dividend seekers should take a look at blank. John, give us a dividend stock right now. Fool in the blank. Okay, so I'm going to stay in the banking realm here. And this is a bank that is, I think, not only one of the best run banks in the country, but I would go so far as to say it's one of the best run companies in the United States. And that is New York Community Bank. Now, for people who aren't familiar with this bank, this they're located in New York City. And their principal line of business is loaning to owners of multifamily units. So this is a very... It's a low volume business, but the numbers are significantly larger per transaction. And one of the things that I love about them is that if you look back over the financial crisis, right, you look back at all the other banks, what you're going to see is you're going to see a lot of loan losses throughout the financial crisis. Well, you just don't see that huge of a spike at New York Community Bank. And that is simply because they take their risk, like analyzing risk very seriously. And the reason I like their dividend stock is because, well, first of all, it pays 6.4%. That's a, that's a deal. So that's nothing to write. I mean, that's nothing to complain about, right? And then beyond that, they are very, very determined to keep that dividend steady. They kept it at a dollar share throughout the entire crisis. And, and again, just like keeping their loans under control, that, that is a huge accomplishment for any financial organization. All right, I'm actually going with, this may be a surprise because it doesn't jump out as a, a dividend payer. This isn't a mortgage rate with, with a double digit yield. This isn't a New York community bank. I'm going with JP Morgan and it might surprise some people, but the stock, I mean, the stock hasn't been a, a huge underperformer recently. It's, it's had a good year. It's had a good last couple years, but I think the performance there isn't justified. And when you look at the dividend, it's almost yielding 3% at this bank. And I think when I look at the earnings power and the actual potential for, for price appreciation in the shares, in addition to that, that dividend moving up in the next couple of years, as the Fed allows banks to return more capital to shareholders, I look at the 3%, I think that's a great yield what, what, that you get while you're potentially waiting uh, for the Fed to, to issue more or to, to allow for more dividends. And I think the potential for the, the share price to move forward uh, is fairly high. So maybe a surprise. It's usually not known as a divid, a huge dividend pair, but I'm going with JP Morgan in this situation. All right, moving on to the last scenario of the day. We're back at Bank of America. We got to talk about it again. Blank is the biggest concern for Bank of America investors. We just talked about all the good things. What's the one thing that's still making you feel a little bit nervous about Bank of America? All right, so I'm going to cheat here and give you three things. The first three things, is okay. expenses. The second is expenses, and the third is expenses. <laughs> Which it, it, Bank of America has got to get their expenses down. If they're able to do that, and all of these investors that bought in when it was cheap, they are going to be reward, rewarded multifold, right? If you can get your efficiency ratio down to 75%, down to 50%, and at the same time, the economy will, will, will recover and the revenues will grow, shareholders would just make a killing on this investment. I'm going to go maybe a little bit more boring, even more boring than expenses. I'm just going to go with mediocre returns and not talking about stock returns. I'm talking about business returns. And when we look at Bank of America for so long, the, the narrative around the investment thesis was this bank is just so cheap. Look at it. It's trading at such a discount to tangible book. That's not really the case anymore. It's trading at right around one times tangible book. And unless the bank can really get return on equity, into the double digits between 10, 12% consistently, I think that's the biggest concern for shareholders because if you're paying one times tangible book for a bank that's just gonna give you 6% return on equity, it doesn't look like that great of a deal. So I'm looking at just the overall business returns of the business. All right, moving on to our final segment of the day, ending it how we always do on the Twitter sphere. Our first tweet is from MasterCard, and this is an interesting, interesting one. They say, Square launched peer-to-peer -peer payments service. Now, I just said MasterCard is tweeting about Square, and the service they're referring to is called Square Cash. And this is a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, service where you can basically email someone $50, $100, and there's no fees, 
uh, on either side, whether you're accepting the payment or giving the payment. Do you think this is a game changer? Is this a, a threat to PayPal? Or what do you think of this service, John? So payment systems, it, this is not one of those, it is not one of those industries where you think is ripe for disruption. Mm -hmm. But but Square has shown that there is a significant opportunity for somebody to move in and to really bring down the cost to people, whether it's say a retailer selling a product or whether it's friends exchanging money. If you can bring down that cost, you're almost certain to attract you know, a, a, a customer base. And that's something we're seeing with Square. Now, is this specific thing going to be a game changer in and of itself? Not so much, right? I mean, this is just making it easier for me to transfer money to say, you know, my friend or my, God help me, my brother-in-law, I need to do that. Um, but, you know, just the overall, what Square is doing in the payments, in this payment sphere is definitely, I guess definitely is probably overstating the case. I, I, I certainly feel like it is a game-changing move. Right. When I, when I think about it, especially from the tweet, I, I stress that it was MasterCard uh, tweeting it about Square that might confuse some people. They might think, well, I thought Square was a, a competitor about MasterCard. I thought this was one of the ones that could disrupt the, the Visa and MasterCard kind of duopoly in the space. But with the, the program Square Cash, you actually have to verify your debit account via MasterCard or Visa. So I think it also shows you how entrenched that those two giants are in the payments networks. And when we talk about PayPal, we talk about Square, these aren't really full-on threats to Visa and MasterCard because they're still owning the networks that, that work between the banks and the, the merchants there. So I thought it was interesting just for, from a, a, a challenger to PayPal potentially, but not a challenger to, to Visa and MasterCard. Moving on to the next tweet, we got this one from the Wall Street Journal's Nick Timorosi says, home builder confidence index drops amid hits of reduced affordability and weaker consumer confidence. That is a very depressing tweet. John, you follow the home builder sector fairly closely. Do you care about home builder confidence and, and, and how they're feeling? Or do you prefer to look at kind of what are the economics? What are the, the housing starts? And wh what do you look at in that space? So, I mean, Home builder confidence, that's not one of the primary metrics that I look at, but that is not to say that it's not important because it kind of gives investors an indication of what these home builders have in the pipeline, right? If their pipeline is going down in the future, well, their confidence is probably going to go down. So it's important for that reason. However, what I would say to investors is that it's much more significant to look at the actual number in the industry. That means new home sales, existing home sales. Uh, mortgage rates, things like that, the actual tangible figures as opposed to indexes that are once removed. And when you look at those figures, while interest rates have shot up over the past, say, five months since the Federal Reserve intimated that it may stop its monthly bond buying purchases mm -hmm. or its bond, bond buying program, we have seen existing home sales do really well. And we've seen new home sales also doing considerably better than they were last year. All right, moving on to our final tweet of the day. We get, this is an interesting one. I like this tweet here. We got it from Vconomics. He says, I'm going to be the debt ceiling for Halloween. That sounds like a good costume. So John, I'm going to put you on the spot right here. What is the weirdest thing you've ever been for Halloween? Going back to, you can go back to college years even. Oh, you know, I've never been a big, um, I've never dressed up for Halloween that much, but this is what I'll say. This isn't weird, but but this is this will give you a, an idea of, of what it's like to be me on Halloween. When I was, you know, between eight years old and fourteen years old, I had a paper I had a paper route. So what I decided to do on Halloween is that I would just dress up as a paper boy. So I just wore my bag, and that also allowed me to collect a, a significant amount of candy. So boring, uh, but a, a, a very functional. Halloween costume. The creative genius of John Maxfield. I'm going to go a little <laughs> bit different. I'm going to go a little bit different than you. I don't know if I should be revealing this, but I was actually the the women's volleyball stars, Misty May and Carrie Walsh, with, with a friend from college, dressed up as women's volleyball players. Not sure I should be divulging that on a, on a national podcast or a show here, but that would be my weirdest Halloween costume ever. Uh, that'll do it for today. Thanks for being here, John. We appreciate it. Matt Kopeneffer will be back next Monday, so we have a couple more days of some guest appearances here. You can tweet at us. We are at TMF Financials. You can tweet your questions, comments, 
and we'll address them right here on the show. As I mentioned earlier, we are now in a podcast form on iTunes and Stitcher. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow.